Welcome back. This is our second lecture on the Baroque. We'll now take a look at Spain. Spain is absolutely a Catholic country at this point. And of course, as such, it is very closely allied to the Catholic Church in Italy. And a lot of the artists that you'll see in this section really do emulate, and I don't mean imitate, I mean try to work in the same manner of, they're not copying so much as those ideas and, and using them in their own work in a new way. These artists emulated Caravaggio. And so we have a new vocab you see right here, Caravagesque, and that literally means that they are Caravaggio-like. The suffix E-S-Q-U-E means or like. Um, you could say, I guess, that Lady Gaga is Madonna-esque. She is similar the type of thing Madonna did in the 80s. Yeah, that's the best I can do. <laughs> so these artists are similar in their approach to the art of Caravaggio. As well in Spain, one of the things that is absolutely uh, critical to understanding what happens um, in Spanish culture is knowing that uh, the Moors Muslims from Africa had controlled much of the peninsula that Spain is part of 11 until 12, 12, and then really were forced out officially by about 1492. So itself has been controlled and has some outside influence for sure. The um, final expulsion really happens by about 1614. So we now have a fully thriving, uh, dominant Catholic culture in Spain, and Spain has also territories under its control. Spain is going to dominate a section of this area that we refer to sometimes as the lowlands. The Netherlands and Holland is this section. The lower section we've already looked at, Flanders. So the Spanish court is going to control this territory long time. So artists of the um, Spanish Baroque, you can clearly see in this example by the painter Ribera, are painting in a very similar way to what Caravaggio was doing, hence the term Caravaggesque. In some respects, you could almost see this as a direct of what Caravaggio was doing. My personal favorite, I think, in a lot of ways, is Saint Jerome and the Angel. It feels like a Spanish variation on what Caravaggio all about with a little bit clearer background and the added addition of this memento mori to remind us what's at stake on a moral. These feel like real people. They feel like everyday people with real bodies. They don't feel idealized. It really is pushing art in a brand new, different direction. The Ribera piece to know for the test is the one to the left. This one is properly now known as the Martyrdom of St. Philip. It was known as the martyrdom of St. Bartholomew, who was flayed alive. We actually saw Bartholomew depicted in Michelangelo's in the Sistine Chapel um, in the section that we believe is a self-portrait by Michelangelo. We saw the figure of the flayed St. Bartholomew. Obviously, this saint is not actually being flayed, and hence we have properly renamed it. Now we know that this is meant to be St. Philip. So ultimately, you are at um, a continuation of what the Italian artists had started in the Renaissance and what and his followers were trying to do in terms of increasing the relatability and the drama as we're moving now into cultures outside of Italy itself. I think with the Spanish, even more of an attention to some of the physicality and the gruesomeness of the scenes, you can see the dislocation in the shoulder joint, for instance. And you can also see an odd thing happening in Italian, or rather in Spanish court painting. As horrifying as today, people with physical differences, such as this figure who's known as the club-footed boy, that's the name of the painting from 1642, uh, were often unable to find employment in any other way other than to kind of display themselves as objects of either so it was not unusual for uh, court painters to sort of center these types of 
people in works that were meant for the upper class to kind of either enjoy weirdly as entertainment. Maybe it made them feel more fortunate, um, but were um, people with a variety of different developmental issues to be treated with less respect than we would in our culture today. Um, for instance, little people would quite often find work um, living and working in the court, but almost kept as it's a little bit shocking to us, I think. A uh, companion to Rivera, in a way, is the work of Francisco de Zurbaran. And the Zurbaran piece to know past is the one to the left. It is Saint Serapion from 1628. And again, we're looking at a crusader. We're looking at saints who stood oppression, tried to secure freedom for Christians that they had preached to and were put to death as a result. But again, you can see very dark background and spotlit lighting, that cellar lighting effect that is so common um, to Caravaggio and to all of his followers, the Caravaggio. You can see the skill that these artists possess and their attention to replicating the real world, I think, really does start to increase in importance. Murillo is an artist I thought you guys might enjoy because he shows um, common people going about everyday life, genre scenes, but genre scenes of the truly poor. It's kind of interesting to think about people with the kind of disposable income and influence to be able to collect in images of street urchins, homeless children. But in fact, that was a prevalent subject in Spanish court painting. This was literally picking lice out of her grandson's hair. Murillo's, Murillo is also well known for altered piece paintings in a slightly more See the image to the right owes a lot to Caravaggio's work that we saw in the previous image, our previous lecture rather. This is a pretty fascinating painting by one of the most influential of the Spanish painters. This is the work of Diego Velasquez, and it shows us a kitchen maid as the main subject. It is what's happening through that opening or window behind her into the next room where the supper at Emmaus is taking place. This is again one of the scenes where Christ appears to the disciples after the crucifixion and entombment, after the resurrection. And so they are amazed that he is who he, who he says he is, that he is. Again, we get a sense of a miracle happening for us, not so much just for the characters in the Bible, but for the real average everyday people around them, like the servant girl in this restaurant where they are having their meal. It's pretty remarkable to think about the impact have. And you can see very clearly in Velasquez's paintings a lot of reference back to what Caravaggio was doing. He uses the same model of his own, not the same models that Caravaggio had, but you'll see some similar faces come back again and again. This character of the boy holding the water is portrayed as slightly uh, better off financially than the other people in the painting. So you again see a contrast of rich, poor, old, young, painting is one of a remarkable series of images from Spanish Baroque that are all about uh, what were known as eating houses, uh, some referred to as bodejones or kitchen pieces. It's a subcategory of genres, uh, genre being a scene of daily life, that takes place in a kitchen. And it was not uncommon in the Spanish Baroque for people who were able to cook to open their kitchens um, to feed people who come to pay a small amount of money for a quickly prepared meal, kind of like the precursor to a short order cook restaurant, like a waffle house. Closely though at the details, you can see what a great master uh, Velasquez really is. These reflections and highlights and, and level of unsurpassed. A piece of Velasquez to know for the test is Water Carrier of Seville. You see the same boy there again with the expensive water glass less well-off uh, character who is literally selling water. This did actually occur. People sold fresh water kind of uh, home to home. You can even see how cool the water is. You can see that the um, ceramic itself is kind of sweating. There's beads of water rolling down the fence. And you can also just barely detect that the glass itself has a fig in it. He's sweetened the water to make it even more attractive to his client. 
just astonishing level of skill. Velazquez definitely knows Caravaggio's paintings, especially of the Bacchus, but this one I find personally hilarious. Clearly Spanish characters, especially the uh, sort of daily life people to the right of the image. But if you notice what's happening, the it's known as Los Borrachos, or the drunks. And what you see on the left is Bacchus and his Bacchanalian followers, but you see contemporarily Baroque Spanish citizens who are enjoying wine and are very much in their cups. They definitely have been drinking for a while. It's really kind of funny when you see this image appealed to us. He was handing us wine, but in Velasquez's version, we're right there with them at the party. Kind of a famous image. Uh, Velasquez, of course, became a very successful court painter to Philip, and so he did several portraits of Philip. And when you see them at a they look like every stitch of that embroidered uh, cloth and fabric in his um, outfit must have been meticulously painted separately. When you see it up close, you can see that, yeah, there's a lot of detail there, but a lot of those are painted with very quick, fluid strokes. It's almost as if in his portraits of King Philip, such as this one to know for the test, that you can kind of see the of some of the modern techniques of the Impressionist painters beginning to be used. Velasquez's portrait of King Philip, known as Fraga Philip, has that name because it was painted after a battle, the Battle of Fraga, in which, of course, the king did not actually directly take part, but we see him painted here as if he is the leader of his military forces. Velasquez definitely is a little bit on the horns of a dilemma. As a court painter, he has to make the court, uh, the king rather appear recognizable, but he also has to flatter him. So he is um, taking someone who's maybe not the most character or certainly the best warrior and trying to make him feel grand and elegant. But look up close at those brush strokes. Look at the sleeves. In here, this area at a distance looks as if it's almost photographic. When you get super close to it, you can see that he's painted this with loose, quick depth almost emphasize highlight and shadow over the individual detail itself. It is a masterclass in how to be an effective painter. And Velasquez will be an inspiration to artists as diverse as the French Impressionists by the time we hit the 1860s and 1880s. Velasquez piece to know for the test for sure, Las Meninas, one of the most important uh, court paintings that I can show you. It seems to be a painting of this little girl in the center. She seems to be the focal point, but the title Las Meninas actually means the ladies in waiting. So the is that the main subject are her servants and her hangers on around her, including the little person, or as they would have said at the time, dwarf, who is part of her uh, retinue or her, uh, her entourage, um, associated very clearly with a pet, with the dog. That's the princess in the center. So obviously there's a disconnect from the title. What is he doing but playing with us? He's playing with our perceptions throughout this painting. The title says it's about the ladies in waiting, but the focal point seems to be the princess. But he's included himself in the image. There he is in his attire, and he's actively painting. But how can he possibly be painting what we're looking at if he's standing behind the princess? Means that the canvas he's working on is the very one we're looking at. He's looking at something else. So is the princess. They're looking toward us. If you look in the background, you see the art collection of the royal family displayed on the walls. All of these are paintings except for the one that is a little shinier. That is a mirror reflecting the true subject, the king and queen being painted from life, from direct observation by Velasquez. It is an incredible painting us to see um, that art is beginning to interact with us more. It doesn't just appeal to the sense of smell and taste and the sound of music. Now it seems as if we are inside the canvas itself. It's just a remarkable achievement. And again, looking at his brushwork, when we get really close, you can really see the shapes of the brushes themselves and the incredible adept ability he has to use that brush in a quick suggestion 
how the fingers, how the nose on this lady in waiting just fade into the background very much in the technique that Leonardo was doing. It makes the figures feel very fully realized as three dimension, three dimensional. I wanted you to see this painting because it's quite important for us later. It's Pablo Picasso, another famous Spanish painter, repainting the subject in an abstract cubist way. But notice Picasso is sort of painting as a chance to show off himself. There is his version of Velázquez, which obviously is an avatar for Picasso himself. Notice how old he is in the painting. Now, obviously, he's the most important thing there. How hilarious. These are a series of some of the shocking portraits I was referring to earlier of people who were sort of kept in the court almost as objects of curiosity. And we know that Velázquez painted their portraits. Um, for the purpose of the court. He also was uh, commissioned to create portraits for the popes. This is Pope Innocent X. We also know that he was able to create images of people who you wouldn't expect to see in visual art at this time. This is most likely an assistant to him when he was working in Rome in early 1650, who was probably enslaved at that time. It really is a remarkable um, record of what life was like. We know that Velazquez himself signed paperwork to free a slave, and that is probably who this is. Just a remarkable uh, accomplishment, I think, in terms of being able to survive a brutal system and then somehow to be able to overcome it. And we think of that story as being so recent, but it's a Velazquez definitely knows his Titian. His paintings of Venus are very similar to Titian's paintings, so we definitely want to remember that. We definitely can look at architecture in Spain as being very elaborate as well, especially when it comes to the interior of the churches. These are the altarpieces, Spanish style. They're known as retablos. In English, it doesn't translate as beautifully. Retable is what we call it in English. And we know that when uh, Spanish mission were being built in the colonies in the New World that the architects tried to imitate the grandeur of this type of architecture and retablo in the New World. 